Welcome back to our second ever episode of Friday Night Mike. Ben Spicer joined by my co-host, Graham County football head coach Scott Grizzle. Coach, we got a, a lot of really good feedback, a lot of listens, a lot of views on YouTube and SoundCloud on our first episode. So I just wanted to take a little moment here to thank everyone who tuned in to our first episode. Make sure you're sharing uh, this episode as well. I know we've got a lot of really good topics to discuss this week uh, and a big win for the Musketeers over Montgomery County to improve to 2-1, and one, Coach. Yeah, absolutely. You know, just uh, excited to see some of the feedback and, you know, everybody getting out there and watching it and, or listening to it. And, um, you know, we just want to keep making it bigger and better every week. And, um, you know, like we mentioned last week, give us some feedback. Let us know what you want to, you know, hear us talk about or, um, you know, what you want us to discuss. And we'll be happy to incorporate it into the show. And, um, you know, it's exciting. Talk a little football and, uh, you know, obviously a, a good week for us on the farm there. Got got our first win in our home opener. And uh, our first win at home this season, I should say. So, uh, you know, exciting, exciting time there, and uh, on to another week. So we're we're already right back at it today, getting ready for the next one. Getting set for week four in Kentucky high school football, uh, college football. Uh, first big weekend uh, was last weekend, and then you got the NFL coming back today. I know uh, you were texting me; you were a little fired up about a topic that we'll discuss. And of course, we'll talk about Greenham County and, and some high school football here coming up, but. Uh, you guys run the spread offense, air raid offense, if you will, at Greenham County. You texted me the other day and said, you know, announcers, college football announcers were just roasting these head coaches, offensive coordinators for sticking with a spread offense in a goal line, short yardage situation. And you said that you had something that you wanted to say about that because, I mean, honestly, I've always wondered the thought process in that as well. Is it just something, you know, you're you're used to being in that formation and you don't want to mix it up? You're more comfortable with that? All your players are more comfortable with that? What goes on uh, in the goal line situations in a spread offense? Yeah, I think there's there's obviously something to be said and benefits to getting under center in those situations. Um, and, and it's not that I'm against it, you know. I mean, um, even, you know, at Green up here, we're, we're in the shotgun probably 99% of the time, but we have an under center package that we can go to if we feel like we need it. But to me, the biggest the biggest frustration just watching that, you know, some college football this weekend were those guys just absolutely bashing. Uh, it was Michigan, and Michigan was down there, you know, in the red zone, and um, they, they stayed in the shotgun. You know, they were just, man, Harbaugh is always under center. You know, I can't believe Harbaugh is letting his offensive coordinator do that, blah, blah, blah. And to me, you know, it's, it's going back to what you said. That's the exact reason is – you know, if you're in the shotgun 99% of the time, why would you want to change your quarterback center exchange yep. at the biggest moment of the game? You know, when you're on the five-yard line or closer getting ready to score, um, your quarterback's comfortable catching that ball in the shotgun. Your running back's comfortable taking the handoff it with that timing and that, you know, footwork and all that. Um, because getting under center don't just change the quarterback center exchange. It changes the running back's footwork. It changes – the quarterback stance, you know, a lot of different stuff. So to me, it's just, you know, do what got you there. You know, I'm a firm believer when you get in the red zone, um, when you get inside the, the goal line situations, you know, you got there for a reason. So don't try to get fancy or change anything. Um, you know, we're going to stay, we're going to stay in the shotgun 99% of the time in those situations, unless maybe we have a new formation that week that I feel is an advantage to us or whatever. But I think you just go with what got you there. A lot of people have the, the thought process, and I don't know if this is, is true or not, but once you get inside the 10, once you get inside the 5, of course the field becomes more condensed. And in that spread offense, you know, you're trying to spread out the field. But once you get into the red zone, you've got a shorter yardage to work with. So does that factor in at all, or, or do you still just run with the stuff that you go with the whole time, or do you have to switch your play call up to where uh, it's shorter routes, shorter shorter passing options for you, or how do you approach red zone offense? Yeah, you definitely have to make some adjustments with, you know, the passing game and your routes and things like that. And that's something you have to work hard in and practice. So we're going to have a – we call it the scoring zone, um, which is from the 20-yard line in, the plus 20 to the goal line. And um, we're going to have like a score zone period every day in practice where we're repping – you know, we're going to go into each game with probably five to eight plays that we're going to run from inside the 20. And we're not going to deviate from that. Those are the, you know, the eight plays we worked hard in that weekend, hard on that week in practice. Those are the ones we feel confident in. So we're going to rep those plays, and our guys, you know, adjust accordingly throughout the week in practice. So on Friday night, when we get, you know, say on the 15 yard line or or wherever, they already know. You know, they know those adjustments they need to make to their routes and things like that. Um, now, 
you know, we might not go under center, but we might add in a tight end or we might add in an H back um, or an extra running back, some things like that to, you know, to be a little bit more physical at the point of attack. But as far as, you know, getting under center and going to like the eye formation or something like that, we're, we're probably going to stick with what, you know, what got us there. Yeah, it's it's like why would you mix it up at that point, especially when when everyone on our team's used to be in a spread formation. It's I don't get it, and I don't really understand the criticism. But I'm not gonna lie, I've I've wondered that from time to time. So uh, it's good to get a little clarification on that. Uh, one thing I wanted to talk about with you this week, though, is at all levels, really in football, you're gonna have injuries. I mean, you hate to see it, you hate to deal with it, but as a coach, you have to manage that. And I'm wondering. You know, from a high school perspective, obviously it's a lot different from an NFL roster where if someone gets hurt, you can go sign someone else if you need to or something like that. A college team with 80 kids on the roster, uh, they're able to, you know, manage things a little more accordingly. But at the high school level, you get an injury to a big guy, uh, your starting running back, for example, in week one in Quentin Farrow. How does that impact your team, not only in a game situation, but in practice and throughout the season? Yeah, that's, you know, that's a huge issue in high school sports. And like you mentioned, I think the biggest factor there is it's not like college in the sense of, you know, in college a guy gets hurt, the backup that comes in is is still a really good player. Yeah. He might not be as good as the starter, but, you know, that guy's on scholarship for a reason. So you he's still Alabama, a really they good just, player. They just plug in another five-star player. It doesn't really matter. <laughs> a- absolutely. So, you know, at the high school level, there typically there's a big drop-off from your – your ones to your twos, yeah. and really the drop the drop off in high school is, you know, you you're probably going to have some good backups. You know, I, I feel confident in our twos. Um, they're, they're they're our second team for a reason. But the big drop off is usually from your two group to your threes, right? Um, and, and that's usually a pretty big gap there. So, you know, you find yourself having to move people around. Um, maybe you putting guys in positions that they haven't played in the past, and they have to learn. You know, in a week. Uh, just to get your best 11 on the field. And I think that's the goal in high school football. Um, it might not always be, for example, you know, you use the example of our running back getting hurt. So our starting running back gets hurt, and we were fortunate to have two guys behind him that are both very capable guys and really good players in Bryce Burgess and Preston Purdy. Um, but in some situations, you might have to take, uh, you know, your starting, your best receiver and put him at running back yeah. just because that's what gets your best guys on the field. Um, and something else that it really impacts are the formations and the personnel that you play with. So, for example, something we're going through right now is we had our starting running back get hurt, and then one of our starting receivers, Braden Craycraft, was out three weeks with a concussion. So we were really thin at receiver anyway. Losing Craycraft, we have pretty much had to go to all tight end sets and using an H-back a lot more than we ever have. Um, if you watch any of our film from the last three years, we're pretty much four four and five wide receiver sets all the time. The last two weeks, we played with a tight end and an H-back almost every snap because we just simply don't have the depth at receiver to play four, four wide receivers right now. Um, and that's something in the preseason, you know, we didn't plan on that. We didn't have maybe that package in or that personnel grouping in, but it's something as a high school coach you got to adapt on the fly. And you have to really trust your assistant coaches um, to get those guys ready, you know, in those new positions. So um, it, it's a challenge, but it makes it makes makes each week kind of interesting because you never know, you know, what you see on film from your opponent one week might be something totally different the next. <laughs> you know, Memf- like we're playing Memphis this week, and they're a traditional, uh, you know, they're in the spread, but they play with an H back and a, a tight end or a fullback a lot, and. You know, they might have an injury and be in five wide empty this this week. You never know. So that's that's kind of what makes high school football fun and interesting are the, the adjustments you have to make from week to week. And I was going to say, fortunately for you guys, you know that H-back position, Garrett Kenny's kind of versatile. He can go out wide, and I know you've put him out wide in some formations as well, but it does mix with your game plan a little bit, and uh, especially when you have an injury like that in-game. You know, Quentin Farrow got hurt in that game against Raceland early on, uh, Braden Craycraft later on in the game. But for Farrow, I mean, he was going to be the workhorse. I think he had five carries or something like that on the first two drives, and then you have to sort of rely on your quarterback and your running backs to step up and fill that void. And I know 
Eli Sammons in that game uh, ended up carrying the ball, I think, over 20 times or right at 20 times. Uh, carried the ball a, a lot against Fleming County as well. But you kind of dialed back from that uh, in that situation, and I think that's something that you have to plan for as well, especially with your quarterback. Uh, you need him. Obviously, he's very important on the team. So did you maybe take that into consideration this week? Because uh, I think I had Sammons only finishing with five carries. So just trying to kind of manage manage his uh, hits and things like that to – get him uh, good to go throughout the rest of the season most definitely I mean he's he's obviously a very important piece to the puzzle for us and you know our goal every week so we keep a hit chart on our quarterback and you know we'll do that you know long after he's gone it's not just because of Eli but that's something that we take you know very seriously is how many hits is our quarterback taking per week and we like to keep him under 10 hits that's that's sacks that's rushing the ball you know, it's hit after the throw, everything. And, you know, when Quentin went down the first game, we, we really had to extend those hits for him. Um, it's just what we had to do, what we felt like we had to do to win the game. Um, but, you know, on a perfect week, on an ideal week, we like him only taking eight to ten hits. So that was something uh, last Friday night against Montgomery County that we felt like we could uh, keep him in that range. And I believe looking back, he only had five contacts. Um throughout the entire game and most of the you know most of those were called run plays so um that that's the goal every week is to keep him clean and keep him off the ground um but at the same time you get in those big situations you got to do whatever it takes and he's obviously a special player so you got to put the ball in his hands in those big situations looking back to last week and this has nothing to do with the game well i mean i guess it does in a sense but uh, it's JFL night for your program. Obviously, halftime is when uh, you introduce all the rosters for the JFL teams, the elementary and middle school teams and things like that. You're in the locker room. You have nothing to do with that. So I'm curious how important it is to have those parents, those boosters, and, and all that great support in the program and just how big of a jump was it from you, you know, going from a coordinator role to a head coaching job, having to take on all those events and coordinating all those things and working with all the parents and things like that. That's yeah. That's one of the biggest adjustments going from an assistant coach to a head coach for sure is dealing with, or I should say, working with the booster club, the administration, the parents, um, the school personnel. You know, like um, your public relations people at school, all that type of stuff. You're really in an administrative role, so you have to learn to be very organized. You have to learn to delegate certain things to certain people. Um, that was one of the things that I really struggled with at first was, you know, telling people what to do. And that's something I still struggle with as a head coach sometimes is being direct and being up front with people and saying, I need you to do this because I don't like, I never like to feel like I'm bossing anybody around. And I never like to feel like I'm, you know, be, you know, being that way towards somebody, I guess, where I'm telling them to do a certain job. Um, but you just have to learn to do that and you have to learn to be very upfront with people and I can't say enough about how great our booster club and our administration have been at Greenup. It's been awesome. Um, you know, we, they raise a ton of money. Um, they work extremely hard. And I think Friday night was kind of a, a, a culmination of everything. You've seen the field looked incredible. You know, for the first time in four years, um, I feel like our playing surface is one of the nicest in the area. Um, the, the new scoreboard, the landscaping around the scoreboard, and that was actually done by uh, – a teacher at the high school, her name is Carrie Davis, and she took her agriculture classes out there every day for a week and worked on that scoreboard for us. And that was just really a good sign for our program that, you know, people care. People are starting to be invested in Greenwich County football. And, you know, every Friday night when those students that worked on that landscaping are in the bleachers and they see that, that's something they can be proud of and feel like they, you know, they have a part in when we win a game. So, it's just awesome to see all the support and it makes a huge difference. You know, our players feel it. You can, you can feel it in the atmosphere at practice and in the locker room. They know that, that this thing's starting to, to mean a lot to a lot of people. And to me, that's, that's a great sign. Yeah, they always say, you know, to build a program up, it takes the town, it takes the community. And how, how important is it to have that investment, not only from your players, not only from your coaches, not only from you, but the community, the boosters, getting fundraising, just stuff behind the scenes that maybe people don't see on the forefront that all comes together on Friday night to, to build that great atmosphere that we saw at the farm last Friday. Yeah, it takes a lot. And, you know, our, uh, our head basketball coach said, you know, I was in his interview process. 
And one of the things that he said that stuck out to me was it takes a village. You know, that's kind of one of the mantras that he used in his interview of how to, to build the basketball program there. And the same thing's true in football. It takes, it takes a lot of people and a lot of people caring and putting in time to make this thing go. Um, for example, you know, we feed our kids. So we're going to feed our players every Monday for JV games, every Thursday for freshman games, and every Friday before the varsity game. Um, we don't let our players go home after school. Uh, that's one of the things in Greenup that's, that's another challenge is, you know, we feel like if we let our kids go home, then, <laughs> you know, you hope you get all of them back, but some of them have 30-minute drives home. So we just keep them after school. And our booster club does a fantastic job in feeding our kids and making sure they have, you know, a proper, not just any food, but, you know, nutritious food and things that will help them prepare for the game. Um, but, you know, that's a task every week, just organizing the food, getting with my booster club president. Um, how many, you know, how many kids are we feeding? You know, what are the menu options? Uh, who's picking it up? All that type of stuff. So um, it's, it is a, you know, a detailed process every week just to get, the behind the scenes stuff done, not to mention the X's and O's and the practice and all that stuff. Well, I've got to ask what kind of food you guys go in with in the goodie bags. That's important. Yeah. So on Mondays and Thursdays for the JV and freshman games, we typically, typically go pretty light. Um, it'll be sandwiches. It'll be maybe pizza. That's about the only time we'll feed them pizza. <laughs> um, but it's something pretty, you know, pretty simple for our boosters to handle on Fridays is when we get the good stuff. So, on Fridays, we're going to eat grilled chicken, baked potatoes, uh, mac and cheese. We've had Texas Roadhouse. Nice. Um, we've had the River. Uh, the River in Portsmouth fed us before the Raceland game. Um, so, we, you know, they do a great job in making sure our kids have good food. Um, you know, not overfeeding them and, you know, not giving them anything that's going to make them tired or sleepy, but, you know, just a, a good source of protein and a carbohydrate and some type of vegetable. That's kind of the – the recipe, you know, a, a grilled chicken, baked potato, and green beans. Something kind of simple but nutritious and something they'll enjoy. And that's something that's big as a coach because I think that's something that a lot of high school kids don't take into consideration. You know, you're trying to put on weight, trying to bulk up. How important is nutrition uh, in, in doing something like that and not just eating good foods but watching what you're drinking, things like that, making sure you're hydrated. I mean, that's also of utmost importance this time of the year when it's still pretty hot outside on Friday nights. Definitely. And we're, you know, we're talking to our kids every day after practice about hydration, um, nutrition, our strength and conditioning coach, uh, coach Moore and coach Tony Sammons. They're on our kids constantly about what they're putting in their bodies. Um, you know, we, we have a rule on Fridays that if we don't see our rotate, our rotate guys. So the guys that are going to play on Friday night, they have to be carrying around a jug of water at school. So when a teacher sees them in the hallway or a coach sees them in the hallway, they better have that jug of water with them drinking out of it on Fridays. And, um, you know, that's, that's a little thing, but I think that kind of, that gives you an edge over teams that don't take that stuff seriously. Um, you know, if we're feeding our kids good food before a game, then to me, that's an edge over a team that's maybe going home and the kids are eating whatever they want, or they're feeding them, you know, pizza or they're feeding them, you know, chicken wings or something like that that's you know that's not really going to provide any type of nutritional benefit throughout the course of the game well i've got one for you coach when i ran cross country uh i don't know why my dad did this i don't know if he wanted to see me fail or what but he i would ask him to to pick me up some food and this was my pre-race cross country meal in high school i would eat a 20 piece chicken nugget and a vanilla shake from mcdonald's and then wonder why i struggled to finish the race (laughs) (laughs) Hey, cross country m- might be a totally different animal, though. That's uh, a long. No. I did not you know, do well. <laughs> <laughs> well, look I at remember that. in Go high ahead. school, I would eat, I would have a Pepsi and a Snickers before every practice. So that was my pre-practice <laughs> every day. I remember uh, my senior year too. Uh, Greenham County played Johnson Central, and I don't know if you remember uh, one of the the best running backs I can recall, maybe over the last decade or so. J.J. Jude there at Johnson Central, phenomenal athlete. Uh, I remember they were playing at Greenham County this year. It was it was 2011, and J.J. had a big game. We were walking around, me and Darius Jackson, over on the on the Johnson Central side, and we see him over on the sideline. This is in the middle of the game, 
and he's drinking a Mountain Dew, and I was like, "What? How? How does that happen?" I don't, it was it was crazy. What would you do if you caught one of one of your players drinking a Mountain Dew in the middle of the game? Oh, they would get right <laughs> on the spot. So we we have this thing we call we call it getting right, and anytime one of our players breaks a team rule or anything like that, they got to get right, and that's twenty burpees. Ooh. So, so, so in-game nothing... sideline, 20 burpees right there? Oh, yeah. No oh, doubt. Oh, man. Yeah. So, it's nothing too crazy. I mean, 20 burpees isn't extremely tough or anything, but it just sends them a little message, and we think, you know, it kind of it gets their mind where it needs to be, maybe get their attention a little bit. And we can, you know, we can make that get right times two or, or whatever. <laughs> but, um, yeah, so, like, if a player walks into one of our team meetings and he's late, he gets right. Right there on the right spot. Right there on the spot. I like that. Yep. That's good. you so got to have good discipline as a head coach, especially at this level. Absolutely. Well, I wanted to move on and talk a little bit more about another aspect uh, that I think people don't really think about a whole lot. And looking at your schedule, and, and I'm a big fan of this. I, I said it on Twitter the other night. Uh, getting to play three teams in a row now from Soda County. That's where I, I actually started out my sports reporter career over there in Portsmouth. So I think it's really cool that you guys – Get the chance, you know, you got Memford coming up this Friday, Wheelersburg at home the next Friday, and then you go to historic Spartan Stadium uh, to take on Notre Dame uh, the Friday after that, the last Friday of September. So how did you get those games on the schedule? Was that all you? Is that something that the athletic director, Matt Gilbert, works with? I know last week you said Coach Egley sort of sent you an email last year and said, hey, we'd love to get you guys on the schedule. Just what goes on to scheduling games and what factors do you have to take into consideration when you schedule those? Yeah, so for me, that's one of the the more fun parts of uh, being a head coach is getting to make your schedule. You know, that's kind of, you know, you play like NCAA football on Xbox or whatever when you're younger, you know, and you know, I always like making the schedule out and putting, you know, kind of strategically piecing those games together. So that's always a real fun time. And I know uh, a lot of head coaches enjoy that. So every two years in Kentucky high school football, your schedule rotates. You're on a two year contract for all these games. Um, when I got the job at Greenup, they were in the first year. So Coach Mullins had already assigned all the new games. So for my first two years at Greenup, I was under the schedule that he put together. Um, so we got a chance to redo it and obviously wanted to get some Ohio schools in. Um, you know, I feel like at Greenup, we're more, we're closer to that Willersburg, Portsmouth. A lot of our population is in South Shore. So we're closer to Willersburg and Portsmouth. And there's a lot of good tradition and good rival, rivalries there between, you know, Greenup and Portsmouth, Notre Dame, Greenup and Willersburg. Um, and really just wanted to get those guys on the schedule and kind of, you know, let that end of the county and that end of the, the area be our niche. Not to say that, you know, we're going to go there and, and dominate those teams or anything because there's some really, really good football down there. But, you know, you got Raceland, Russell, Ashland, Boyd County, kind of all in the Ashland area. And we felt like it was maybe an opportunity to get some games down in the Portsmouth area. Um, and kind of explore that side, you know, that side of the river down there. So, um, you know, I got with uh, Coach uh, – the Willersburg head coach my first year at Greenup. Coach Woodward, sorry. <laughs> and um, my first year at Greenup, we were at a seven-on-seven, seven, and he said, hey, man, when you – you know, when your schedule rotates, would you guys be interested in playing? And I was like, absolutely. Um, and that was, you know, three years ago. So we've kind of kept that – it was just a, an agreement there on the on the practice field at Raceland. And we kind of kept that agreement. And sure enough, when the schedule came up to rotate and I gave him a text and, you know, we made it happen. So I think that's going to be a really fun game for both schools and both communities. That's a historic rival that I think there's going to be a a huge crowd there. And, um, you know, obviously two good football programs going at it. And Willersburg has a ton of tradition. So it's going to be a fun environment. I talked with Coach Sammons, uh, I think it was last year, you know, about playing. He he had Valley, Lucasville Valley, and uh, Portsmouth West on his schedule last year, two teams from Soda County as well. And I just kind of asked, you know, what went along with that. And he says sometimes it's hard to even find games. I don't know if that's just location issues or or what it is, but have you had issues maybe finding teams to play and and to put on the schedule here in your last couple years at Greenham County? It is, and, you know, I think it's an issue – um, it's an issue everywhere, but 
here locally, um, you know, I kind of feel like you have you have a wide variety. You have Class A teams all the way up to you know three A and four A, including Johnson Central. So, you know, you get some teams just don't want to play bigger schools and and things like that. And then take Raceland for an example, and um, obviously, you know, a very good program. Well, there's not a lot of three A or you know bigger schools that want to play Raceland right. because <laughs> it's kind of one of those catch twenty two things. If you beat them, then you probably, you know, people are going to say, well, you should beat them. They're a 1A school. And if they beat you, then it's an upset. Right. Um, it's like now, play, it's like scheduling Army and Boise State in, in college. Exactly. Now, I, I personally don't feel that way because I know they're a good program. And, yeah. I, you know, I, I don't feel that way. But from the outside looking in, I feel like some people, you know, feel that way about it. And then, you know, for us, um, just being, you know, 100% honest about it, there's – some local teams that didn't want to play us because they know we have a really good quarterback and they don't want him on their schedule. Yeah. <laughs> and it can be, it can just be as simple as that because, you know, they're trying to win games too. Right. And, um, you know, I think there's a, there's a fine line there. Um, me personally, I want to play good teams because I want my kids to be prepared for the playoffs and for district play. So the way I kind of divide my schedule is I like to have, I like to have three games that I feel like we're definitely the favorite in. That you know, three games that I feel like if we play average to a you know above average, we're definitely going to win, or we should win. Um, then I like to have three games to where we're probably the underdog. We're you know we're going to have to play our best game to beat these guys. And then the other four games, you know, you like to have your district games, um, and those you can't schedule. Yeah. So that's that's kind of the way I divide it up. Three games that I feel like we're the favorite, three that I feel like we're the underdog, and then you have your district games. I'm not going to put you on the spot and ask you uh, where you're going to qualify each each one of those teams that you're playing this year, uh, what category you would put them in. But before we wrap things up, uh, I just wanted to – is there anything else you want to touch on before we finish thing out? What are you looking forward to this week as you take on Memphis at home? Yeah, just really looking forward to another opportunity to play at home and – you know, that atmosphere Friday night was awesome. So I hope we can, you know, make that even bigger and better this Friday night. And um, a, a really good quality football team coming to town. I've had the opportunity today to watch them on film and start that process of breaking them down and um, evaluating their players. And, you know, they got some big, strong kids. Um, like we mentioned, their, their running backs are really good player. Their quarterbacks are really good player. So it's going to be another challenging week. And, um, we're looking forward to it, but you know I think there's a lot of a lot of good football around the area this week. And to me, this is kind of the time of the year where you start to really find out, you know, where everybody's at as a team. Yeah. Um, you know, week one, week two, you're still kind of filling everybody out. There's not a lot of, you know, a lot of data, so to speak, or or whatever out there um, to evaluate. But now you can really start finding out, you know, who's who's the top tier teams and who you know? Who you're looking forward to uh, to watching in the playoffs, and who can make a run, and things like that. So, to me, this is kind of the the really fun part of the year. You know, you finish up maybe some of your pre district games, um, and then you know district schedules will be here before we know it, and that's when, as we all know, that's when it's really important those district games. Coach, as always, we appreciate your time. We're excited to talk to you. We're excited for this week as Greenham County gets set to take on the Memphis Falcons at home. Looking forward to that one. That's a game. We'll be out there for the first time with My Town TV. And, of course, you can tune in on the Cool Hit Sports Network as well if you're not able to make it out. Uh, make sure you share. Leave us some feedback. Let us know what you want to hear on next week's episode. As always, uh, I'm Ben Spicer. For my co-host, Scott Grizzle, thanks for listening to another episode of Friday Night Mike.